delighted to draw and everybody's out this morning to, to hear this because I think the future of Rehoboth is obviously very important to all of us. I know it is to me. I've, as most of you probably know, spent my entire life in Rehoboth. I've been the mayor for 26 years now, going on 27. So Rehoboth is in my veins, my bones, and everything. And so I'm very concerned about it. And we, you know, we fought some battles over the years to help preserve it. And I think we've done a, you know, maybe not knowing exactly where we were going. We've made some very good decisions, very uh, prophetic decisions about the future of Rehoboth. But we need to keep vigilant and take it to the next step, probably, because there are a lot of interests that are pushing us in directions that I don't think are necessarily good. We, uh, we need to decide for ourselves what we want to be. Don't let the market uh, push us in a direction that, that uh, is not necessarily good. And I think you're going to hear from our speaker that uniqueness is, is vital. And that is what I think we have our spades in when it comes to, to ocean resorts is the unique character of Rehoboth, the trees. But most important, I hear this all the time, is the people in Rehoboth. And it's the business, it's, our, it's the friendliness of this town. Um, a number of people just tell me they come back because it's, it's clean, it's friendly, and they just enjoy it so very much. So I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, in, to introduce um, Mr. McMahon, Ed McMahon, uh, he's uh, the Senior Fellow for Sustainable Development at the Urban Land Institute. He joined the Institute in 2004. He's the author of The Better Models for Development in Delaware, Ideas for Creating More Livable and Prosperous Communities. Uh, the book was written in 2004. Um, Mr. McMahon was good, kind enough to give me a copy of it yesterday. So he has uh, a lot of experience, no doubt, but a local experience. Um, he's helped uh, communities in all 50 states and has authored, has co authored uh, 15 books. But uh, as I said, he comes with not only great experience in this area, but uh, he co owns a house in Lewis. So he spent as much time, I'm sure, as he can, uh, given his busy schedule in our area. So he's not unfamiliar. He is very familiar with this area. And I think uh, you will learn a lot this morning from Ed. And I am delighted to introduce Ed McMahon. Great. Uh, thank you, Ed. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you here this morning. Um, it's a beautiful day out. It's, I'm like amazed by this crowd here on such a, such a lovely day. So here's a question that I think many of you are interested in, is how do you preserve the goose that lays the golden egg? So we're going to talk about tourism this morning because this, of course, is a city and a community and a county. It's driven by a tourism economy. And tourism is kind of important because it is the biggest industry in the world. It is the first, second, or third largest industry in every single American state. So everybody seems to like tourism, but they kind of forget oftentimes that there are two sides of the tourism economy, the two faces of tourism. And of course, tourism has many benefits, and you've experienced them here, new jobs, expanded tax base, enhanced infrastructure, improved facilities, market for local products, arts and crafts, etc. But there's also some downsides as well. Traffic congestion, crowds, noise, crime, haphazard development, cost of living increases, degraded resources. Anybody been to Route 1 recently? <laughs> you know, so what you want to try to do is to maximize the benefits of tourism while minimizing the burdens of tourism. Maximize the benefits, minimize the burdens. You know, there's a, we spend a lot of time at the American Planning Association talking about these kind of things. And, you know, I think this sums it up. They say the impacts of tourism on a community can be beneficial if planned and managed or extremely damaging if left without controls. So, you know, really managing tourism and getting the benefits begins by understanding that all tourists are not created equal. Some tourists will come here, they'll spend more money, they'll require less in the way of services, et cetera. They'll, you know, like, you know, the old saying about take only pictures, leave only footprints. But let me show you the opposite of that. So this was the spring break capital of America when I was in college. 
Welcome to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And of course, they wanted to be the spring break capital of America. They thought it was a great idea to invite down a couple of million college kids every spring. Uh, and, but of course, what they didn't count on was that these kids were going to sleep six to eight to a room. The only thing they'd spend money on was beer. They would tear the entire place up. They'd have to hire all kinds of extra police and cleanup crews, and pretty soon you'd, they got a reputation as this drunken, out of control kind of college kid kind of town. And so nobody else wanted to go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. But you know, they made a conscious decision to not be the spring break capital of the world. Today it's Cancun and Panama City where all the young people go. And you know, what's interesting about Fort Lauderdale is they don't have as many tourists as they used to have, but now the tourists who do come sleep due to a room. And they eat in nice restaurants and they shop in nice shops. They do not have to hire extra police. They do not have to hire extra cleanup crews, etc. So as a result, fewer tourists are actually leading to more money with less hassle and less resentment. Okay, maximize the benefits, minimize the burdens. So what you need to know is there are really two kinds of tourism. There's mass market tourism and there is sustainable tourism. And mass market tourism is really all about heads in beds. You know, it's artificial, homogenized, generic, formulaic. You know, it's about quantity. On the other hand, sustainable tourism is about things that are authentic, specialized, unique, homegrown. It's about quality. And you know, let me give you some examples. So, you know, mass market tourism, mega hotels. I remember when I first started coming down here with a lifeguard in Bethany Beach when I was in college. For, and we didn't have any high rises between Bethany and uh, Ocean City. And you had, you know, Bobby Baker's carousel at whatever that was, 80, 180th Street or something. And, Nothing but open beach. Now it's just one 40-story building after another. Or theme parks or cruise ships or chain stores. Well, how about, you know, places like this? Sustainable destinations, historic buildings, unspoiled scenery, locally owned businesses. You know, if you spend a dollar in a chain store, most of that dollar will leave your community. But if you spend a dollar in a locally owned business, it will recirculate to your community at a rate almost three times more than the dollar spent in the chain store. Because the local person has a local attorney, and has a local accountant, has a local advertising, and the money recirculates through the community. You know, there was a study, the National Geographic did a study of cruise ship passengers on the island of St. Lucia, and comparing that to people who went and stayed in small locally owned inns, and it turns out the people who went and stayed in locally owned inns or small hotels were spending 18 times per day more than the cruise ship passengers. Because most of the expenditures on the cruise ships, which are now like 5,000 persons per ship, are, go back to the cruise ship company, the Carnival, and, you know, big global corporation. So the community was spending all their money but getting very little in return, except for all of the crowding, the congestion, et cetera, that go when you have 4,000, 4, 5,000 person cruise ships show up at the same time. So what you need to think about is that you know mass market tourism, yes, high volume, high impact, but it's also low yield. And one of the reasons why the cruise ships keep getting bigger and bigger is because they need more and more rooms to justify what they're charging per room for these things. But sustainable tourism, lower impact, lower volume, but higher yield. Which one makes more sense for Rehoboth? You need to answer that. So I'm going to talk about a few things today. I'm going to talk about some of the, the keys to this idea, tourism is more than marketing, protecting community character, the focusing on the authentic, telling your story, getting people out of cars, managing growth and recognizing limits. All right, let's talk about marketing for a second. You know, uh, marketing is incredibly important. And most places, most people, you know, decide to visit a place before they've even seen it. And so that's where, where marketing comes in. And it does all those things, it positions destination, it promotes visitation segments, visitors, provides information about a place, et cetera. But the best marketing is always word of mouth. And when do you get word of mouth? You get word of mouth when the reality of the place meets or exceeds the mental image that you have been sold through marketing and promotion. You go home and tell your friends, oh, I loved Rehoboth, it was great, you should go too. On the other hand, if 
the reality of the place does not meet the mental image you've been sold through marketing. But you feel disappointed. You feel let down. You go home and you tell your friends. You know, it was not all it was cracked up to be. It was too crowded. It was too congested. It was too much just like everywhere else. You know, so, you know, you've all seen, you know, these tourism brochures that always have the, the couple walking hand in hand into the sunset, you know. But what happens if you got there and you saw this? You know, you can't find any place to put your blanket and you're, you know, fighting for a parking space and so on and so forth. And so the reality of the place is oftentimes very different from, you know, what you have come to expect. You know, some years ago, Southern Living Magazine had an article about this, and they started off and said something like, the, the colorful brochures and ads that southern cities and towns use to promote their charms are always filled with attractive scenes, sunsets, azaleas in bloom, historic house museum beautifully photographed, maybe something like that. But then it went on to say, step away from the great columned house and you will find, as likely as not, a billboard uh, on one side and the other a, a, a parking lot that is barren except for a flashing portable sign or a towering billboard. They said the city brochure is handsome, the city is not. You know, the truth is, the more any community does to enhance its distinctiveness, the more people want to go there. On the other hand, the more any community in America comes to look just like every place else, the less reason there is to go there. Because, you know, what is tourism? At its very essence, it's visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. I mean, if every place was just like every place else, there'd simply be no reason to travel any place. You know, and the problem is, is the people who live in a place often tune things out. But visitors always see things with a fresh set of eyes. They always see the things that make it either the same or different. Because that's exactly what tourists are looking for. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that every single day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to vacation, where to retire, based on what our communities look like, what they look like. And you know, successful communities truly are distinctive communities. You know, it's so funny, you got, some of you probably heard this slogan, keep Austin weird, you know, or keep Albuquerque quirky, they call it. <laughs> You know, and those are not just funny slogans. They're, they actually think they're economic and development imperative. They mean keep them different, unusual. Keep them on the cutting edge. You know, the CEOs for cities, they say a very interesting thing. They say the unique characteristics of a place may be the only truly defensible source of competitive advantage for cities and towns today. That's the only thing everybody else can't replicate are the things that set you apart. So maintaining those things is kind of important in the world. And in fact, this is a new publication by the World Bank. It's on the economics of uniqueness. And they make the same argument all the way through this book. They say, if you can't differentiate your community, your project, et cetera, from anybody else, you have no competitive advantage. Put another way, sameness is a minus in the world we live in today. It is not a plus. So let me just give you an example. So this is the official travel guide for the state of Oregon. Check out their slogan, Oregon things look different here. Can you imagine a state travel brochure that says something like, Delaware, things look the same here. <laughs> well, of course not, because that wouldn't encourage anybody to want to come, right? So, you know, this is a pretty important concept. And I know some people are saying, well, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I've heard this a lot of times, and I always say, okay, you think that's right? Well, you tell me, does this scenic view have more value, or does that scenic view have more value? Let, let me tell you what the, the leading real estate appraisers in the United States say about this topic. So, um, let me find it. They say, quote, you can take beauty to the bank. You can put a dollar value on a view. Scenic landscapes are an economic asset, not just because you and I think they're nice, but because other people are willing to pay to see the view and to experience the unique character of a place. I mean, the principle is pretty simple if you think about it. You know, you, go to, you rent a hotel room with a view of the ocean, 
you will pay more for that room than the exact same room on the other side of the hotel. What are you paying for? You're paying for the view. You know, every community, every community has places that are worth preserving. And, you know, some of those places, you know, like the Art Deco Historic District in Miami are pretty obvious. That's the largest collection of Art Deco buildings in America. But others like the, you know, the elephant in Margate, New Jersey, which was built by a developer for his house in the 1890s. By the way, that's a real house next to it, just to give you the scale there. You know, so there's all kinds of things that can be historic and worth preserving and, you know, and it turns out also we have something called heritage tourism and it turns out that people are interested in old things and old neighborhoods and historic buildings. They stay longer and they come back more often and they spend more money than people who just want to go to the beach. So, you know, once again, all tourists are not created equal. And, you know, Arthur Fromer sums it up pretty well. He says, among cities and towns with no particular recreational appeal, those that preserve their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourists at all. Tourists simply won't, <coughs> won't go to a city or town that's lost its soul, etc. All right, I want to tell you a little bit about this. We, you know, what is the story of Rehoboth? You know, people drive, I come to a community, people drive me around tell me the story of a community. But what I want to suggest to you is that you want to make the story of Rehoboth manifest in the landscape. You know, people won't preserve what they don't understand. And so you have a story to tell here, and, I, and you, there are a lot of different ways you can do that. I want to suggest you might think about how to use public art to incre increase the value of this community, enliven it, et cetera. And you know, so these are some examples of you know, just you know, statues, that, you know, one in Annapolis of Thurgood Marshall or Dolly Parton in Sevierville. You know, a lot of places have famous people, and so they've done things like this. But, you know, or celebrate famous events like the lunch counter sit-in in Greensboro or Washington Cross in the Delaware. But you might also celebrate ordinary people, you know, like the watermen in Massachusetts or the ranchers in Wyoming or the coal miners in Pennsylvania or even the unemployed workers at the, that's the Franklin Memorial, uh, the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial in D.C. where people line up and get with the homeless workers to have their pictures taken. You know, this is out in Seattle. It's called Waiting for the Inner Urban. There used to be a streetcar line that went down this street. And they're, and they're waiting for the streetcar. But, it, I mean, it's not coming, but they don't really seem to care. <laughs> but it's become a placemaker for the neighborhood. It tells you where you are. So this is a mural we used to have in Tacoma Park. It was our family album. Each one of those pictures tells a story that was important to our town. So Wiley's was the ice cream parlor that was the inspiration for the television show Happy Days, just as an example. This is the Yankee Flyer Diner mural in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. The Yankee Flyer Diner was an institution in Nashua that burned down and they brought it back to life in this mural. How'd they pay for the mural? Well, all the people in the mural are actually real people who live in Nashville today. They all paid to have their pictures put into the mural. <laughs> old postcards, maybe you could do something like this out on the boardway with, let, let's show people what old Rehoboth used to look like. Or maybe what, you know, Route 1 used to look like, you know, 40 <laughs> years ago. Uh, you know, you can integrate art into infrastructure, something we used to routinely do. And we're starting to do that again. These are some of the boat, boat sculptures on the Riverwalk in Milford. But there's all kinds of things like murals on freeways, bridges, et cetera, et cetera. Even water towers uh, can be turned into things. That's uh, Luling, Texas, the water matter of the capital. That's Clanton, Alabama, the peace capital of Alabama. And that's out in Iowa. We can enliven the streetscape using public art. And you know, there's a lot of fun things you can do. So every, you know, you got walls like this. Every blank town's got a big blank wall. So what could you do with that? Maybe you could do something like this. They, they finally had to put a sign up here because people were trying to drive into this. <laughs> but, you know, art can create fun, whimsy, excitement. It creates a love note from the town. People start to take pictures of these things. They, they talk about these things. So maybe here at, on the, at, you know, in the bathhouses, maybe you could do something like that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I'm going to end by talking a little bit about this. Recognize limits. How many tourists are too many tourists. How much congestion is too much congestion? How many RVs are too many RVs? How many tour buses are too many tour buses? How many McMansions? That's actually a real development in China, by the way. Uh, those are real houses. Uh, how many McMansions are too many McMansions? How many fishermen? We call that combat fishing up in, uh, <laughs> up in Alaska. Okay. Basically, ladies and gentlemen, to be successful, tourism development must be managed. You know, and you know, smart communities know this because you see this resident parking only. If you don't, you create resentment. You create 
you know, you get all the downsides of the tourism without the upside. And so once again, I want you to think about how you, you, you maximize the benefits of tourism while minimizing the burdens. And I'm gonna end by just uh, showing you one example here. This is Sanibel, Florida. And Sanibel used to be part of Lee County, Florida, and it was gonna look a lot like Ocean City until they basically seceded from the county. They incorporated a city called Sanibel Island, and they decided to do the first carrying capacity analysis in the United States. Basically, they said, how many people and houses can we safely accommodate on this island without destroying our beaches, without destroying the Jing Darling National Wildlife Refuge, while having enough water, while being able to evacuate during a hurricane, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very distinctive, charming place, has a very high level of visitation, but it does not look like most of Florida. There are no high rises, a three-story height limit. There are bike trails along every major road, every one uh, on, on the island. It has become sort of the model for doing it the right way. So these are my secrets of successful communities. So successful communities always have a vision for the future. You know, some people might call that a plan for the future. And I can tell you that there are a lot of people in America who I run into who tell me they're against planning. And I say, okay, then you tell me the name of any successful organization, institution, corporation that doesn't plan for the future. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. As the book of Proverbs says, without vision, the people will perish. You know, and successful visions always begin by inventorying your assets. And then successful communities build all their plans, whether it's a land use plan, an economic development plan, a tourism plan, et cetera, around the enhancement of their existing assets. And successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives, not just regulation. Now, I didn't say I'm against regulation prevents bad things from happening, sets a minimum standard of conduct. You gotta have some regulations, but you also need to think about how you can encourage people to do the right thing. Successful communities pick and choose among development proposals. All development is not created equal. The biggest impediment to better development in small communities and rural places in America is a fear of saying no to anything. Well, if you're afraid to say no to anything, you will get the worst of everything. Welcome to Route 1, once again. You know, they simply wouldn't say no to anybody. They couldn't put any demands on any developer to do anything. Okay, you want to do that? Fine, no problem. Okay, well, that's the way you compete right to the bottom. Successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefits. Successful communities consider what they look like. Successful communities have strong leaders and committed citizens. 